In the mysterious caverns below the castle, your odyssey continues against the awesome forces that oppose your efforts to reach the Dragon's Lair. Many, many moons ago, I played a game called Dragon's Lair, created by esteemed ex-Disney animator Don Bluth, as in The Secret of Nim or American Tale, to name but a few. The game was the realisation of The Dream, a Disney Bluth movie as a game. Of course, it was not really a game, nothing more than movie files that played out as you push left or right, hit fire to play the next sequence, or watch the end sequence. Nevertheless, it made a huge impact and stood out for a long period as a visual tour de force. Now, thanks to the passion, graft and sheer technical majesty of Insomniac and helped by the potential the PS5 offers, that dream in the early 80s is now a reality in Ratchet and Clank. But this is much more than a trick. This is next generation gaming now. And where we're going, we don't need spinning platters. Are ye sure? This new game follows on from Enter the Nexus from the PS3 days, built on the back of the 2016 Ratchet reboot on the PlayStation 4. You and your robot pal set out for a celebration for your good deeds and retirement. Something nefarious happens, obviously, but from then on in, you are thrust inside an interdimensional tale that covers multiple planets, characters, and of course, weapons. They have mixed up the style somewhat, taking segments we saw later in the 2016 title and incorporating them earlier in the game via other controllable characters, boosted and improved of course. The true scene stealer with all the best lines though is Dr. Nefarious. Whenever he crops up, I was chuckling like a pixelated incarnation of Jim Carrey. Can't anyone print instruction manuals anymore? As you do not have to tackle planets in any direct order, even able to leave them part way through and return later, the variety here is excellent, giving a modern day shoot 'em up vibe throughout. But visually, it is incredible. Now the game is out, I can show and talk more about the game and just how gobsmacking it all is. I think it can help the discussion to break down some of the key areas as it is so impressive and just what and why it makes it so. Now let's start with the most obvious and something that gains the most PR impact. Ray tracing. Now it continues and improves on the ray tracing Insomniac delivered with Spider-Man. The change here though is in the use is far more dynamic, exhaustive and adds much more to characters and cinematics. The cost of the reflections themselves are expensive of course, being built up of lower LOD versions of the game's main objects and then used as required once the surface is sampled and then retrieves the relevant LOD version and object from within those structured containers. This itself will present the reflection which will now take into account the surface normal, the direction and even include the curvature of it and the relevant depth between the reflective projector and the objects to or from it. In this world of robots and intergalactic travel though, not all surfaces are equal and the different levels of surface makeup will affect that reflection. From high specular metal balls being mirror-like to the brushed metal of Clank himself or the brass covers on the ground. The variety of micro facets are emulated with a roughness level and also a drop off from the reflective object to the receiver. The inherent pixel based stochastic sampling allows the team to create a drop off of the surface by increasing the dispersion of these samples as they denoise the image. This means that longer reflections can become less detailed and disperse away or diffuse from the object itself becomes noisier as it moves away from that reflector or the clearer it gets as it moves closer to it. Now this is one area the team obviously reduced in that performance RT mode. They take the reconstructed 3840 by 2160 reflections in the fidelity mode, which also look to be reconstructing that back from a lower dynamic scaling resolution. And then they use a similar technique in the performance RT mode, but now from a base of 1280 by 720. And in addition, they also raise the roughness cutoff on these surfaces, which helps reduce the amount of surfaces that reflect objects, as you can see on the floor section here, comparing them side by side. This effectively reduces that reflection recursive ray that goes off to sample the object. All of that gets cooled on these higher roughness level surfaces, reducing the cost, but a very minimal impact. 
In addition, they also appear to reduce some of the surface material contribution to the reflection, but this could also be just the result of that lower resolution or even a reduction in the denoiser cost of the algorithm. Either or, it never ceases to impress, even in the 60 FPS mode, how good those ray trace reflections and how abundantly they're used. The sheer amount of proxy objects within their BVH is impressive nonetheless. Everything seems to reflect at all times and all surfaces seem to have that level including the expensive transparencies and that Fresnel edge here as you can see as I move the camera around that sharper reflectance becomes stronger as you get more to an oblique angle with the Fresnel reflectance of the object and even dual reflections from that concave surface. It consistently reflects everything in the title and even self reflecting on bodies it's impressive how much they've managed to squeeze into it. But if you can't take that reduction in resolution, then you can go to the performance mode, which obviously gives you screen space reflections exclusively. But you notice that far more often than you would notice the small hike in image quality over that performance RT mode. It still uses screen space reflections as a fallback on large water bodies in the other modes, but obviously it's far less abundant than it is here, and it's only a backup most of the time. Here, it stands out with that reduction. There obviously are points in the title that still use cube maps and don't reflect anything at all but those surfaces are few and far between but again it's a standard performance saving how exactly will we fix the fixer hmm. i guess we have to turn him on first it brings us nicely onto another area that's so impressive, materials. They really utilize them well here. PBR based materials are obviously used abundantly, but the quality of those can vary significantly. And here Insomniac are right at the top of the tree. The ray trace reflections certainly help in big areas, but it's not just that. It's the reactions to light itself in terms of how they disperse light on diffuse surfaces, how different materials stand out as different materials. You can see the self-shadowing of Rivet and Ratchet on their fur. You can see it on other NPC characters. But on the top of that, they've got other aspects such as plastic areas, plastic wood and boulders that look plastic like a theme park. And then later on, you see a real wood on the pirate ship, which stands out as real wood. Sand, rock, metal, everything has such a diversity in terms of its light characteristics and how it reacts to the light, it really is impressive. They also keep the poly count quite low and that really helps draw some of those areas that we see, specifically that spline hair technique that they use. In conjunction with the ray trace reflections, all of these areas give such a consistency and a wide value of materials across every aspect of the game that really impress me consistently. And it brings us to the third piece with why I think all of this collectively works so well. And it's something that I've harped on about for years. Lighting. They really are at the top of the level in terms of how they construct many aspects of the game in terms of the lighting of the levels. Being a limited title, not being open world, it means they can light certain levels and scenes exactly as they want. Obviously, there are areas here that have weaker aspects and some areas don't stand out as well as others, but that's always true of every game. Give them more time and they would have created those consistencies. But where they do stand out, they look amazing. One of my favorites is when you save the large robot that's troubled and that level itself is lit so well and so consistently that all the materials in there look so convincing. And it's topped off by that final piece that wraps everything together. And that's Insomniac's post-processing techniques. You need to leave on that per object motion blur, even if you're playing at 60 FPS. You need to leave on that depth of field. Certainly, you can drop down that chromatic aberration if you want to. That really doesn't add a lot more, to, in my opinion, to the visual quality. But those other areas do. So when you're playing the title and you're aiming down the scopes and that depth of field kicks in, that motion blur of objects and limbs all adds up to give that consistency that you are playing a Pixar game. And a good comparison I can use here is an old film, 2005 Robots, with a similar dystopian robot-based world. Very metallic, lots of different materials. Look at a scene here from gameplay at 30 FPS compared to a similar scene shooting through fast areas in this film. Now, if you jump these in with cutscenes from the title itself, that visual quality, the lighting construction, the detail of the materials, the objects, the reflectance, ray trace reflections as well, all of that comes very, very close. And that includes things like the high quality shadows. Now, if you dig in, you would obviously see certain points, but that would work both ways. There's certainly areas in the new Ratchet title that are better than this 2005 CGI film. Dear, your friend has a saucy tongue. My name is Pierre Lafayre. 
Pirate Extraordinaire. I'll fight you for it. Again, it's always hard to compare like for like when something is so drastically different. But generally, as you can see, the quality of the materials, the construction, the animation, the movement, and certainly those real-time cinematics, which the entire game is, all that stand out as being significantly close or better than what we see in some of those, you know, approaching 10 to 15 year old CGI films. And some of these examples I'm giving you are in gameplay. Now, a big reason why all these worlds and levels look so good and the materials are so convincing is they use volumetric lights abundantly. Many of the light sources are of a volumetric construction, most likely using a voxel-based grid, but they use these and also reflect in ray trace reflections, all add a sense of solidity and construction to the world. Many light sources have fog volumes around them, and they use these in the indoors and outdoor areas just to add additional density, like atmospheric scattering here, which creates that light prism and creates and builds depth and solidity to the world. But it's not just these areas. They mix up these fog volumes and these volumetric light sources with other areas of their post-processing pipeline in terms of bloom, the depth of field, the bokeh shapes in the background, and lens flare. All of these elements just add little flourishes that adds that level of solidity. When they use those bloom areas, it can highlight the light bounce and the prism of light inside denser areas. And then they mix all these up to allow light sources to attenuate from the different areas of their physically based models. You can see a good shot here as the light flashes in the background. It creates multiple shadows due to that directional light source being moved around to simulate that lightning flash. But in addition to that, you've also got that light attenuation in the clouds and the sky. And all of that just adds that additional level of believability to the world and brings it that one step closer to those CGI movies I just mentioned. But it also uses the PS5 hardware in other ways. Loading is a good example. It's a bit hit and miss with the card still on the OS system, but you can get it to go straight from the dashboard to the game in 7.45 seconds, but it doesn't always work, so that's a bit hit and miss. But going from that cartridge icon on the load screen, I love that little reference, you can load in around 2.4 seconds straight into the game. That's incredibly fast, and faster than back in the heyday, the 16-bit heyday on the Sega Mega Drive. Here looking at the original Disney title in Aladdin, the one that stood the test of time and really stood out back then it takes 12.4 seconds to go from boot up into the game quickly skipping as much as you can those splash screens and that is impeccable in terms of speed we are actually now not only back at cartridge days we're besting them and i hope to see this improve and enhance on the ps5 and the series x and the series s in similar fashion but also performance is another area to discuss not a lot to discuss here it's absolutely impeccable in the fidelity mode it targets 3840 by 2160 using that insomniac temporal injection and it dynamically scales testing more sections it can go as low as 2560 by 1440 it's often somewhere at the top end but it can dip down when it's heavily swamped in certain areas but again because of that temporal injection it's very hard to spot then moving over to that performance mode where obviously all of that ray tracing goodness is turned off, then you do get a slightly lower resolution. It still tries to reconstruct that image back using that TAA injection up to 3840 by 2160, but now it has a lower base. It can go as high as 3264 by 1836 on my counts, but as low as 1920 by 1080. Again, that's very, very rare, but it can happen. And then finally, in that ray trace mode, in that 60 FPS, the ceiling is capped out, as I discussed before, 2560 by 1440. That's the level it targets now, does not go any higher, and it can scale down to 1920 by 1080. Again, the temporal injection solution that Insomniac use is very, very good. Along with the artistic changes they make to the materials themselves and the sharpening inside that, it does give a very clean and sharp image across all versions. And as you can see with these comparisons, it's very hard to choose between which one. The performance is obviously one that you would make that leap for, and that's why the Performance RT mode is always the one that most will choose. There is a certain level of, of look and visual uh, connection you get from that 30 FPS mode in the cinematics, which still stands proud. Some of that is due to the additional elements they add in that version. So ray trace reflections are covered are better, texture details and resolution is higher, the geometry in a lot of objects, hair, other distant objects, draw distance, all of those are subtly improved and post-processing effects are enhanced. So they're all minor, but they all add up to an improved image quality that you just notice, even if you don't notice, if you know what I mean.
But aside that, performance is pretty much locked in all modes, aside those jump between scenes. Obviously loading in textures and assets from one shot to the next and they hold that one frame or two just to give you that stability in terms of jumping around with physics. And they're reduced down to like 16 millisecond skips on the 60 FPS version. So they're very, very hard to spot. And I doubt many people would if you're not looking at it. In fact, the only time it really dips any higher than that, most of the time, I'm saying 99% of the time, is when it's jumping between worlds and the limited use that it has of that SSD streaming between separate worlds. It's very, very impressive when it does. And it really does stream a huge amount of data in and out very quickly into RAM. It's not just the SSD, remember, it's also about that I construction and the offloaded elements of the PS5 which limit the amount of effort and strain put on the system itself so the CPU and the memory allocation is all offloaded so that the actual system itself can handle a lot more when it's doing it but certainly you can get 66 millisecond spikes on occasion jump between worlds but we are talking literally unloading one world specifically from RAM and loading a brand new one within the matter of a second well a couple of milliseconds a couple of hundred milliseconds at worst so all of that is very, very impressive. It's a shame that they do not use it you know, extensively in the title. There's key areas where they use it and where they do it stands out. But I would have liked to have seen more of that use in the title. But again, it is early days. So I hope to see more, certainly from Insomniac, in using this technology. But also other teams also embracing this more and more and using it to drive gameplay. Because that's the one of the best elements that we're seeing here in Ratchet & Clank because it drives the gameplay and the choices. It'll affect a great many things in terms of game layout, level design, and everything else, and I really want to see this be pushed forward, in not only Insomnia, but also other teams, and even, if we can, get to a level of the multi-platform titles that utilize the SSD and the internal in instruction in terms of getting data in and out of RAM so fast that you can use it to construct elements of worlds that you couldn't think of before, because now, you only think about the frustrum view rather than the entire level view and that just opens up options generally across all game types and all styles to sum it all up the performance is as impressive as the game and the visuals themselves certainly there's areas here for improvement certainly it's got some bugs and issues occasionally that crop up you know clicking triangle to get to certain sections falling through the floor but all of these things like this patch is always coming so they're no worse or better than most other titles of this ilk and this certainly the last couple of generations i'm not excusing it but obviously nothing game breaking here so that's absolutely fine and overall, I just wanted to cover this title. I know that I've already covered it on IGN and I did get review code from Sony, so I want to make sure that I keep my channel in terms of content specific to what I want to cover. And this is one title and a few others that I'll touch on a little later on, but hopefully this was a little bit more in depth and gave you a little bit of a bigger insight into terms of why Ratchet & Clank is so impressive and why I was so impressed. As always, if you do like what I do here, and remember I am completely self-funded and independent, then you can help by hitting that subscribe button, hitting the like, commenting down below, because all of that helps the engagement on the video. And if you can, any dollars or pounds really helps widen my research and certainly widen my equipment to do even more work here and hopefully turn this into something more than just a side project, which it currently is. You can click the link on my Patreon below. I'll catch you all very soon on the next one. Get out of here before...